Hey everybody, Hoosier Jedi here with another review for you, this time talking episode 14 of season 4 of Arrow called Code of Silence. And uh, in general, this is a reasonably good episode, not the most exciting one of the series, but again, an all-around competent episode that I don't have a lot of complaints about. So let's just get right into things. Um, let's get the island flashback out of the way. Now, first of all, it's cool to finally get have Conklin get what's coming to him. That's definitely been overdue. Um, what's interesting here about this bit is um, two things. One, we've got Tiana really kind of going the, hey, you've got to become a monster in order to kill a monster idea, which is kind of a bit of a contrast to sort of Oliver's vision of Shadow that he's been having. He's been telling him, like, you know, forgive yourself, let go of the guilt. And, you know, accept that he's a human that makes mistakes, in essence. So here he's got these two sort of female figures pulling him in, in rather opposite directions. Uh, now, what Baron Ritter, where this place, that, this mystical place that Baron Ritter is talking about, um, seeing as how Lian Yu isn't a place in the comics, there's nothing really huge that jumps to my mind. Uh, the only place I can really think of is Skartaris, which is sort of, um, not exactly a world inside the world, but it's more like you can kind of fly through these portals and end up in this sort of savage dinosaur land, kind of like the savage land from the X-Men comics. It's not a place that I know really super well. Um, it's where the character Warlord uh, hangs out a lot. Uh, but again, that's a character that's pretty obscure, not really somebody I know a lot about. And again, that's just sort of the first thing that jumps to my mind. I don't really have any solid evidence about that and um i really don't think it's that i think it would be something that would be more solidly connected to mysticism something like i don't know the house of mystery or something but if they were doing that um then they wouldn't be going through like some kind of weird crazy island out in the middle of some fictional part of uh, the ocean near china so really i got no idea what that could be uh moving into the present day uh it's interesting that apparently Damien Dark's wife, um, like even the mid people in Hive are like, seriously, her? Does she, does she have the political chops to pull this off? You know, considering that her opponent is Oliver Queen, a guy with uh, a past reputation as a drunken playboy. And they're like, uh, I don't know, is she going to be able to take this guy? <laughs> Uh, which, of course, leads to some pretty that rather interesting scene where Damien Dark uh, kills that uh, other member of Hive um, using his magic, which is a little surprising because it's sort of, been, when we've seen the other members of Hive, it sort of it seemed as if they were, had some serious degree of influence over Dark that he didn't want to act against them. And here he kills one of them in front of everybody else in the organization. So it's just like, Okay, is Damien Dark the de facto leader of Hive, or is he just a part and he has to kind of bow down to the, everyone else from time to time? I mean, I, 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 given his nature, I kind of would assume that somebody like Dark would really be the de facto leader. But, I don't know, it just seems like they've been slightly inconsistent as to um, Dark's role in Hive. Let's put it that way. Again, for the most part, he's been presented as the de facto leader, but I don't know. Uh, now, apparently, it looks like uh, Malcolm has been accepted into the Hive fold. I mean, they're letting him hang out in the secret clubhouse with the um, interestingly decorated tables, um, which kind of makes me wonder, one, they're almost certainly going to kill Damien Dark off at the end of this season. I mean, there's just no way it's not going to happen. Uh, but John Barrowman is quite happy, uh, by all accounts, to continue being on Arrow. And, well, if uh, you kill off Damien Dark, Hive's going to need a new leader, and Malcolm is in need of a new evil organization with which to lead. And, um, let's see, Damien Dark also used to be in the League of Assassins. Just saying. Just saying. And it is... I like how... Malcolm does give Hive information, but he is very deliberate not to say, oh, by the way, Oliver Queen is the arrow. 
because that would just basically put a big fat target on Dia's back. So, you know, that, that does make sense. Uh, nothing really much to say about Rouve Adams herself as a character. She just um, sort of does throw that pithy, like, my husband, you had an appointment with my husband, he doesn't like being stood up, and by the way, here are some goons to fight while I slip away. Um, were, did those guys get arrested or something at the end, or did like Team Arrow just leave those guys laying there on the ground? It's like, yeah, you know, there's, there's nothing we can do about these guys. That's, that's really something they probably should have addressed, really. Uh, let's see. Uh, speaking of uh, small little things, I do like how Diggle mentions like Andy is sort of unofficially poking around the dark web, supplying them with uh, information, what information he can about what's going on with Hive. <sighs> Excuse me. I was trying to hold that one in until I finished the review, but uh, when you got a yawn, you got a yawn. Um, let's see. And I did like that he mentioned that Diggle did confirm that, yeah, Lila is in charge of Argus these days. Um, apart from that, nothing really particularly huge to say about Dig. Um, some really nice stuff going on with Quentin and Donna this episode. Uh, they've really been bring stepping up Donna as a character these last few episodes. And here she really comes out and shines. I really like how she, she gets on Quentin's case and is like, look, I've got a grade A BS detector and you're obviously lying to me. Everything that's happened in my past, I can't tolerate this. And, you know, good on her for that. But I do like how Felicity kind of like, look, you Quentin's a good guy. You know he wouldn't lie to you unless there was a very good reason. You know, maybe maybe give him a chance here. And the relationship between Quentin and Donna, I mean, it does genuinely play out as being uh, very, very sweet. And you, I was honestly happy when they managed to get past that. And I really like how that dovetailed nicely with Felicity's speech to her mom about, you know what, you deserve to be happy. And you're going to find someone who's going to make you happy. Which was a great follow-up to what Donna had said about, you know, you know, I've been living my life vicariously through you. you know, Oliver is this amazing guy. You guys are going to have a great family together. You know, it's everything that I always wanted for myself, but I know I'm never going to have. So this, of course, does bring up the question of, once again, who's in that grave? And while Quinn has been my number one suspect so far, now I'm kind of having to wonder if maybe it might be Donna. I mean, if you know Don, her mother got killed, obviously Felicity would be super upset. And um, even if it is Quentin, if this was somebody who she thought was going to be able to give her mother that happiness that she wanted for so long, then again, Felicity has really good reason to be super upset. Never mind the fact that you know she already considers Quentin to be an ally of all. So I would say those two are probably on the top lists of people who are going to get bumped off. Um, by the way, it really would have been cool if they'd acknowledged one way or the other if um, Donna knows that Felicity had her dad arrested. Probably something uh, they could have mentioned. Uh, speaking of Felicity, uh, Curtis Holt, Mr. Terrific, nice little nod to that this episode, uh, the um, bio implant or whatever it is he called that. Now, basically in the comics, that's how they restored Barbara Gordon uh, to being able to walk again um, and you know, be able to be Batgirl again. And that was always kind of one of the things that um, was a real annoyance to a lot of fans. Like, look, they got all this amazing technology in the DC Universe. Why can't they do something to fix Barbara Gordon's legs or make it so that she can walk again? And that always did seem like one of those, why doesn't anybody ever figure out that Clark Kent is actually Superman? You know, I mean, there's sort of been reasonable explanations thrown out there from time to time, more on the Clark Kent thing than on the Barbara Gordon thing. But that always did be one, strike me as one of those things. It's like, yeah, if you can, like, time travel and clone people and have all this crazy technology, I'm pretty sure you should be able to restore the nervous system well enough to cure somebody who, you know, had spinal cord damage. So, yeah, they're obviously not going to keep Felicity in that chair forever, but her 
return to action, shall we say, they're not going to make that immediate. They want this to be something that is a, a thing that lasts. And probably when they get past that, it's going to lead up to a nice moment of uh, Felicity getting to kick some ass. Uh, do remember in Season 2, she was actually the one who ultimately stabbed Slade with that uh, syringe that removed his Mirakuru powers. I always loved that the, the, at the end of the day, it was actually Felicity Smoke who defeated Deathstroke, not Oliver Queen. That was that was a brilliant stroke on the writer's part. Um, let's see. Uh, speaking of Quentin, we got to see some ni more nice stuff with uh, him and Laurel. Nice to see him sort of throwing out a little bit of AA wisdom. Um, him not being a little bit more suspicious, suspicious, suspicious about that uh, call to the abandoned building, which they said it was um, an office. Well, they, I can't remember. There was like a writing on the thing that talked about like the divide between the rich and the poor, which kind of made me think it was like a bank or something like that. And then they said it was some other type of business that didn't seem like anything with financial anything to do with being financial, which seemed a little weird to me. Uh, but that uh, shot with the building coming down around them, that was uh, that was very well filmed. That seemed a little crazy. I mean, like, like Quinton said, it felt like the building attacked him. I actually wondered, like, but did Damien Dark use his magic on this place or something? And of course, no. It's just like this really well-timed um, demolition stuff. But still, that was definitely a very cool, very exciting action sequence. And I honestly thought, like, whoa, are they going to kill somebody off at this part of uh, the season? Uh, I kind of figured that would be much later on. But no, everybody, both Quentin and Laurel, got out of there. But um, still, cool stuff there. And again, the destruction of that factory, also really nicely done. I got to say, the location work uh, in this episode was really strong. You know, the, the office building, the factory, that really cool theater where they have the debate and the big fight at the end. That was really, really nicely done. Nicely done, by the way. Uh, action in this episode, no complaints whatsoever. Arrows, usual nice quality of standard. Quality of standard, I should say. Uh, um, but yeah, the the location scouts really did some nice work uh, this episode. Uh, again, that theater, absolutely beautiful place. Um, let's see. Um, Thea had several nice moments this episode. I particularly liked, liked her bit with the fire alarm. But especially loved that situation with her figuring out that Oliver had a kid and confronting him about it. And, you know, you can see Oliver's very palpable relief. It's like, finally, finally I can talk to somebody about this. And it was interesting that Thea took Samantha's side. But given how she knows a lot about being the target of uh, all the people that orbit around her and her mother, it kind of makes sense that she would feel that way. Now, I still uh, under still feel that Oliver really, I mean, he is William's father. He does have every legal right in the world to um, spend time with his kid. But <clears throat> he wants to sort of show respect to Samantha try and do right by her when he obviously did not when he was a younger man, so that's why he's willing to play by her rules. But I still think Oliver really should have said, like, look, I I'll, I'll, I respect what you do, but there's this woman, especially now that I mean, we're engaged to be married, I have to, she has to know about this. I would be doing wrong by her if I did not. So I really think Oliver should kind of at least go out there and try to negotiate a little exception out of Samantha on that one. Although um, Thea's caution is proven to be very warranted here because, oh, look, uh, William's fallen into the hands of Damien Dark. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good at all. Mm, let's see. Do I have anything else that I wanted to talk about in this episode? Um, well, I love how... Um, the um, Hive guys who are all like, uh, is, is Damien's wife up to this politically? And then Oliver apparently completely kicked her butt in the debate. So it's just like, man, uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's pretty hilarious. I mean, I just imagine like Damien Dark and his wife just sitting around at home going like, oh. And, you know, we are again brought up to the question of like, what 
the hell is Hive doing? Why are they going through all this trouble, and why are they doing it in Star City? Why? Um, one other thing I want to say before I wrap this up. Uh, when they were talking about, like, okay, what building are they going to blow up? I'm like, and then they cut to commercial. I'm like, well, probably Palmer Technologies. Because that's like the one, you know, financial bright spot in the city. And then when the show comes back, the first thing we see is the Palmer Technologies building. And then we find out, like, oh, no, it's the theater where they're going to have this debate. Like, I did not expect that. Nice twist. You surprised me, show. I love that. Uh, speaking of which, that theater, I'm pretty sure that's the same theater that um, they use on The Flash whenever somebody goes to the movies. I'm pretty sure that's like where Cisco took Kendra, and that's where um, I think Barry and Iris went to see a movie one time. Uh, yeah. Well, there's there's only so much Vancouver, right? And uh, with that, guys, I think I'm going to call it here. Uh, as always, please comment, rate, subscribe, and of course, you can follow me on Twitter at Who's Your Jedi. And please also join me on Tumblr at Jedi Reviewer. Until next time, take care and have a good one.